Hello everyone, uh, my name is Pierre Lapadri and I'm really excited to be here to present our work on browser fingerprinting. Uh, Today, you know, the web uh, is really beautiful. I mean, you can go on the web with any device that you like, uh, any operating systems, any browser, any applications. And to make it all work today, you need HTML and JavaScript. So when you connect on a server, uh, you say, all right, this is a type of my device, so this is my screen resolution. And then the server knows what version of the website to get back to you so that, you know, in the end, you get a really comfortable experience browsing the web. The problem is with all of these device specific information that one can uh, collect, we have what we call, in contrary to the beautiful part of the internet, what we call the beast. It's all the hidden trackers that are on the internet and that will uh, collect as much information as possible uh, on your device. And they use that to build a unique identifier called a brother fingerprint. So here is an example of a browser fingerprint. So on the left of the table, you've got the list of attributes that we collect. So we collect that through HTTP headers, JavaScript, and plugins if they are available. And you can see, you know, that uh, you can collect information on several layers of the system, on the, on the browser, on the operating system, and even on the hardware itself. And so this list of attributes that we can see here are exactly the list, uh, are exactly the attributes that the great folks at the EFF collected six years ago when they did their panoptic study. Uh, but you know, in the past six years, a lot has changed, and the browser landscape has evolved. First, you know, now a, a lot more and more people are browsing uh, the internet uh, with their mobile devices, and uh, the time spent on application and, and on smartphone is becoming greater than on desktops. And so, what is the, what is the impact of that uh, on browser fingerprinting? Are mobile fingerprints different than on desktops? Other thing is that you know, every year there are new features and new APIs that are added in, in the browser. And so notably here, we have the Canvas API and the WebGL API, so we can draw, our, uh, draw uh, shapes in the browser and render 3D scenes. And so what, what is the impact of this API on browser fingerprinting? Can we use them uh, to collect information? And finally, also something that is currently uh, going on, which is the disappearance of browser plugins. Uh, Today, you know, and happy plugin, so it's the old plugin architecture uh, is being deprecated, so I'm going to get back later on on that uh, uh, during the presentation. And also, the number of sites using Flash is quickly dropping. Uh, uh, five years ago, there were approximately 50% of websites uh, that had, uh, 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 there was 50% of the top million websites that had a Flash component in the, in the, in the web page, and now it's dropping and it's uh, less than 40%. So what What's, what the impact of this disappearance of browser plugin on fingerprinting? And so to answer uh, all these questions, uh, we decided, all right, we are going to take this list of attributes. We are going to add more, so uh, new attributes to Flash, to WebGL API. So we use both new, new, uh, new attributes that we discovered and also attributes that were discovered by other researchers. And we, we launched in November 2014 amionic.org. So if you have your computer right now, you can go on it. And what the website does is that uh, it uh, collects your browser fingerprint and compares it to all the other fingerprints that were collected before. And so here is uh, one of the main results of our study, which is the entropy for all the attributes that we collect. So on the x-axis, we have the different attributes. And on the y-axis, we have the, the entropy for all the attributes uh, for different categories of fingerprints. Uh, so in green, it's all the fingerprints of our data sets. In blue, all the desktop fingerprints. And in red, all the mobile fingerprints, that is our smartphone or tablets. And so, so far, we collected more than 150,000 different fingerprints. And one interesting result that we got really quickly is that 90% of fingerprints that we collected were unique. That means tracking is possible. So basically, with that number, we confirm what uh, the Panoptic uh, study uh, found out uh, six years ago, is that you know, by collecting enough information, you can identify easily uh, users on the internet. And so now I'm going to get into detail. Of, uh, uh, I'm going to detail several attributes. Uh, the, the first uh, here is to show you that not everything that we collect is meaningful. Uh, so for example, here uh, we have got the, the, the presence of cookies or not, or uh, the value for the do not track header. 
and what we collect is basically a, a Boolean attribute, yes or no. And so with that, you don't learn a lot of information about a device. And so here we see that the entropy is very low. So if you want to identify a device through other fingerprints, you have to turn to uh, other attributes. Uh, now, if we take a look at the plugins and font, we can see on the bar charts on the left that there is a pretty big gap between desktops and mobile fingerprints. And the reason for this is pretty simple because on mobile you don't have uh, any plugins. Uh, HTML today is supposed to be complete enough so that you don't need to rely on any plugins to, uh, to offer some features to uh, your client. Uh, and also, since we use uh, the Flash plugin to collect the list of fonts, uh, since there are no uh, plugin on mobile devices, we don't have access to that list of fonts. So that's why the entropy for uh, uh, mobile fingerprint is close to zero. Uh, for desktop fingerprints, uh, the, for, in our data set, it's the top three of the highest revealing attributes. And we basically confirm what was found out by Panoptic like six years ago. They, they concluded exactly the same thing. And also, we were incredibly surprised by the wealth that we discovered. We detected more than, uh, more than 2,400 dif different plugins and more than uh, 220,000 different phones. So if we did not collect that, we would have never guessed there would be such, uh, such a big diversity of phones and plugins on the internet. Now if you take a look at the user agent, uh, we can see that overall it's pretty high for both desktop and mobile. But what surprised us the most here is that uh, the entropy for mobile devices is the single highest value of our whole study. And so we wanted to understand why. Why is that? What makes user agent on mobile devices so different than on desktops? And so here is an example of a user agent taken from the Facebook application. And here are some information that you cannot find on desktop that you can find on mobile devices. So you can see here that uh, we can uh, find uh, the model of the phone here with uh, the iPhone string that we can find in the user agent. We can also find out the exact version of the firmware that is used, and it's up to the minor updates. So basically, uh, all the uh, iOS and Android user base is divided into uh, several categories with each their own uh, uh, firmware version. And then we were also really surprised to find out that apps are not restricted in any way to modify the user agent the way they want. Uh, and so here, uh, the Facebook application has access uh, to your phone operator, to your phone operator, and it directly includes, uh, includes it inside the user agent. So normally something that the browser doesn't have access to, uh, the app does have access to that information uh, and includes it in the user agent. And so, yeah, for all these reasons, uh, the entropy uh, for the user or for mobile devices is, 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 is high and, and higher than on desktop. And also, yeah, one smartphone out of four uh, in our data set was uh, instantaneously recognizable with just the user, the user agent. So for us, it was uh, pretty surprising. Uh, then for the last focus I want to do on the attribute that we collect is about canvas fingerprinting. Uh, so canvas fingerprinting is a, a newcomer in the family of browser fingerprinting. It has been uh, discovered recently, and we are the first on Aminic to do a large-scale analysis on, on the diversity uh, in the in client side. And what Canvas fingerprinting consists in, it's, it's we use a Canvas API to draw shapes and render forms in the browser. Uh, it's basically a big drawing board where you can uh, draw anything that you want. And what's interesting about Canvas fingerprinting is that the result depends on both hardware and software. Depending on your operating system, on your graphic card, on the phone that I installed, the, the result will, uh, will change. And so now I'm going to explain a little bit uh, deeper uh, what, uh, what it's all about. So how does it work? Well, it's really simple. Uh, we send a JavaScript file with all the, with all the instructions for the browser to execute. Then, you know, depending on its configuration, uh, the computer will generate uh, a picture and it sends it back to the server. So what's interesting here is that we can see exactly, we can recreate the image and see exactly what the rendering for, the, for our canvas test is for each device. And so our test, uh, here we create the canvas element, we specify the dimensions, and then we say, all right, brother, can you uh, draw me an orange rectangle at this specific location? We say, also, can you render me this string with all of the letters of the alphabet and a specific Unicode character at the end? 
And what's specific about this is that we ask for a font that does not exist. And so what does the browser do? Uh, well, it uses what's called a fallback font. It's a font that is used in case a glyph is missing or is not supported, or in case the font that is being hashed is not present on the operating system. And so this fallback font is interesting because depending on your device and your operating system, it will be different. And finally, the last thing that we ask you, uh, to, uh, is we ask the browser to uh, draw the exact censoring uh, a little bit bigger with a different color and with a font that is much more common in today's operating system, which is uh, the Arial font. And so here is the result of, uh, uh, of the Canvas test for my own laptop. So if you go on myunique.org right now, you can see how it looks on your own device. And our result is that canvas fingerprinting is the first uh, highest uh, revealing attribute in a fingerprint, which is uh, pretty high. And what's important also is that canvas fingerprinting is uh, really stable. You can run the test many, many times, and uh, you will always get uh, the same result. And I'm pointing that out because we tried using the WebGL API to draw 3D forms inside the browser, but we didn't find the right set of parameters to tweak so that uh, the result that we would get would be stable enough for us to use. And what we found out is that you know, there is a big diversity of renderings between devices. You can have a difference between pixel, a difference between, uh, with the font that is used. And what you can see here is that uh, the last character uh, is, uh, really sp is, is special and is different. And in fact, it's an emoji. So uh, an emoji is not an emoticon, it's a representation of an emotion. And depending, uh, uh, and it's up to the front developer you know, to uh, provide their own interpretation of that emotion. And so depending on the, operating on the operating system, and even depending on the manufacturer of your device, uh, the font which contains the emoji uh, can differ. And so by just collecting this single uh, character, you can learn a lot of information uh, uh, about a user's device. So for all these reasons here, our canvas fingerprinting uh, is a pretty strong addition inside you know, our, our fingerprinting script today. Now I want to talk about some future scenarios. So what would happen to browser fingerprinting if some evolution happened inside our browser? So here's a scenario which is the hand of browser plugins is something that is currently uh, uh, going on. So uh, several years ago, Google said, all right, the old NPAPI plugin architecture uh, is the leading cause of crashes, bugs, and security incidents, so we have to remove it. And so from uh, version 42 of Chrome, they disabled the support of NPAPI plugin. And from the version 45, they completely removed the, uh, the support of, of this plugin. And what we can see on the graph is that as soon as the support of this plugin is, is disabled, uh, the entropy is, is, is quickly dropping, and it's now it's, it's coming down to almost zero. And so when we saw uh, earlier that uh, plugins and phones were really useful to identify uh, desktops, in the future, plugins uh, will, uh, that are used in, you know, in browser fingerprinting will, be, will become much more limited. Also, in a scenario also, uh, which is much more, uh, much more unlikely, which is what would life be without JavaScript? Or in other terms, what would happen if everybody tomorrow decided to use something like NoScript? And uh, with JavaScript, we have 90% of fingerprints that are unique. And if we remove JavaScript, so that means that we, uh, we don't collect anything from JavaScript, but we only have HTTP headers, uh, the number of unique fingerprints drops to less uh, than 30%. And if we combine that with what we call uh, generic user agents, we drop to uh, less than 10%. So generic user agents for us is user agents that are much less precise. So when we saw uh, earlier that uh, we could have the formula and the firmware uh, version of a, of a device, uh, for us, generic user agent will be something like instead of having um, a Nexus 5X with Android, on Android 6.0.1, we would have maybe a mobile uh, on Android 6, but not much information so that in the end, you know, much more people would share the same user agent. And now, uh, at the conclusion to the presentation, uh, Browser fingerprinting today is still as easy as it was uh, six years ago. You know, with a simple script, you can collect many device uh, specific information without uh, any really big problem. Uh, canvas fingerprinting, which is a newcomer here, uh, is really stable and has a high entropy on both desktops 
and mobile devices. Uh, mobile fingerprinting is also possible, but for different reasons than on desktops. Uh, on mobile, it's mostly the user agents and canvas fingerprinting, which helps us identify devices. But on desktops, uh, it's still plugins and phones, even if you know in the future it's going to change. And finally, we show that some simple browser modification could drastically improve privacy without really impacting uh, the way the web currently works. So uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Hi, uh, this is Pratik here uh, from NUS. Uh, I think it's an interesting uh, study. Um, but you know, you started the talk by saying um, the reason why people are fingerprinting is to do with customization of what content gets served, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering if you've uh, had thoughts about a follow-up study saying that how many of these features really are being used by websites to deliver different content, right? So, so we can clearly see that there are lots of attributes here to, to, to track you. But if none of them are really useful for you know, targeting content, then, then maybe we can just, just take them out. Um, uh, and also, this also has to do with things like the JavaScript-based uh, uh, fingerprinting. I mean, browsers are updating all the time. And, yeah. and that's very you know, uh, clear that we are going to see a lot of fingerprints given this frequency of updates. right? So any thoughts on, on where to go next from, from this kind of a study? Well, uh, the thing is today, you know, with all the attributes that we collect, uh, a study on how they are used really truly by website would be really interesting. And, and, but the thing is, for example, you know, if you uh, take the, the user agent, uh, if you download a, a software, you know, a website can get, uh, can uh, pass the user agent to give the correct version of the software, you know, depending on your operating system and, or, and on, your, on your browser. Or, for example, the screen resolution, you may don't see it, but maybe all these responsive websites use that uh, to adapt uh, live all this content. So, it, it should be really interesting to do a study to how exactly how much of this attribute that we collect uh, is are really used and how much we could do to maybe uh, remove them or maybe limit them to be much less precise so that it does a, 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 a less bigger impact on identification. Okay, let's rotate here. Uh, Thorsten Holz from Ruhr University, Bochum. So I have two questions related to the mobile fingerprinting. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, are you actually fingerprinting the mobile device or are you rather fingerprinting the application? Because in your example, you had Facebook and yeah. probably Safari. It looks completely different. We are fingerprinting. I mean, we are collecting information with uh, the, the, the way the user is connecting to the website. So if he's using uh, the browser, we are, con we are communicating with the browser to collect information. If uh, the user is connecting through uh, an application, we are using that too. But most of the time, for example, the Facebook application, it's uh, people who are who open a link through the Facebook application, and it's like a web view we open that they use to uh, visit our website. So we don't um, necessarily communicate with the app to get information on top of what on what a browser can access to. Uh, but yeah, we are basically limited to browsers in general. Uh, I don't know if that answers okay. your question. Yeah. Yeah, to a certain extent. Um, and the second thing is, so for Android, I can see that there's a huge difference. But for, let's say, two Apple iPhone 6, yeah. can you also differentiate between both, or do they look the same? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, th the thing is, uh, today, you know, there is a lot of diversity. So if firmware version are different, or uh, if some people use application that are less widespread, for example, you can go on the Apple Store and download maybe a browser that a lot, not a lot of people are using. So uh, if you don't limit yourself to what's basically included inside the the, the smartphone, the default thing, uh, you may really uh, uh, have a, a fingerprint that is different than you know the the majority of people. Okay, um, so this implies basically for, let's say, iOS devices, you cannot really differentiate between them. You just know this is some iPhone, but you cannot pinpoint it. So you cannot really fingerprint one device, but just know the class of iPhones. But, uh, 
we can fingerprint a certain part, but then exactly, you know, if we take the, ex we didn't have made uh, any study, but if we take the exact same phone with the exact same hardware and the exact same application installed on it, we don't know yet if there could be differences or tests that can be run that could differentiate them. So we don't, because, you know, all the people that are connecting our website, we don't know the full extent of that configuration. So we, you know, a test with exactly diff uh, identical device would be really interesting to, to do.